You are listening to the 15th broadcast of TBR Radio's TBR History Hour. With your host, TBR Contributing Editor, Dr. Edward DeVries. On today's show, Dr. Ed talks with William Chad Newsom, developer of the Christendom Curriculum. The Christendom Curriculum is the world's only Christian, nationalist, pro-Western civilization homeschool curriculum. Well, what do you say we just dig right into today's interview? Thanks. And so, William, welcome to the TBR History Hour. And as the author of the Christendom Curriculum, first of all, I want you to tell us what motivated you to write a new homeschool curriculum. I mean, because there are already, you know, at least a few Christian homeschool curriculums out there. Many of them do the job very well. What I saw missing was uh, an emphasis on we, on Christendom and culture war. Those two, are, those are the two areas. And Christendom here, we could understand in a more um, popular sense as Christian nationalism. There's always more to learn for the church. There's always things that we're perhaps not uh, emphasizing as we should. So um, one of those, I think, is the Bible's doctrine of nations. So I saw that this was not um, being talked about. We, we don't have an emphasis on a philosophy of history that emphasizes the rule of Christ. I think in, in American evangelicalism especially, there seems to be this idea that Christ becomes king at the end of history, and then everything is good. But the Bible teaches that he became king long ago, and um, the nations are called to submit themselves to him. Secularism, therefore, is an act of treason against the king of the world. There, there's tends to be a, a suspicion of nationalism, and, it, and, and yet that's exactly where the battle is in our day, nationalism versus globalism. It's become more that, I think, than even the traditional left-right battle that we're used to. That has to be dealt with, because if, if we can't cure our nations, we can't even have nations anymore, which is what the open borders globalists want to happen, then we're going to have a lot of problems. Paul seems to indicate in Acts 17 the nations, the boundaries are set by God for the purpose of making it easier for them to, to, to grope and to seek after God. Globalism tends to destroy the ability of peoples to do that. So the first thing was Christendom and Christian nationalism. The second was cultural war, because I think that uh, what we have um, with our curricular choices is good in a lot of ways. There's a lot of different things that you can choose from, and they all have their strengths. But many of them are either unaware of the culture issues of our day, the, the inroads that have been made into our culture over many decades by cultural Marxism and the way that has been used to destroy the Christian lands of the West. If not unaware, many of them are actively compromised with it to one extent or another, perhaps unwittingly, perhaps just kind of blindly, but that raises issues of everything from nationalism to, we talk about pluralism, uh, we, we talk about social justice warriors, but in a way that um, that age could more easily understand. In the upper years, there's more uh, specific talk of, of the issues like multiculturalism, racism, um, nationalism, globalism, and so on. Um, and these are presented. At, these are these are provided. There are dozens of these throughout the curriculum, and they're pre they're provided as supplements to help guide the reading of of kids because they're going to read a lot of books in this curriculum. When you're reading a book, it's, it's helpful to have certain ideas in mind, certain, a, a certain system of thought that can guide you. So you know what to look for. You know how to read a book in light of Christendom, you know, in light of uh, Christ's kingdom, or how to take lessons from the great works that we can then apply to our situation. So that's the purpose of those. And these, these were the things that, th this was the reason and the, I think the result of, of it. So. I didn't feel myself to be the best person for the job, but uh, my thought at the time was waiting for the right person to come along. There's no way to win a culture war, so I took a stab at it. I do have a background in creating training materials, and I have written for a, a, a popular Western civilization curriculum before, and I've written a, a few other books and novels, so I had some of that going for me, but I'm not an expert, and I, and I think the assumption uh, of the homeschool movement is that really experts are not needed. I mean, we do, we do rely on expertise, obviously. Every time I hand my child a book, I'm, I'm handing him something that I feel that can be said better by the author of that book than I can. We're outsourcing our education, in a sense, when we hand our child a book. But we don't need the educational elite, the self-appointed experts. We can do this on our own. 
Um, but, but what we want to provide in this curriculum is a little guidance on the, the great issues of our time so that children can grow up expecting to engage and not just to be a, I think pietism is, has been a, a thing that's eroded us and taught us to just, you know, live in, entirely inside our heads as spiritual people instead of going out and conquering and taking back territory for the kingdom of Christ. And I think children need to learn to grow up into that. Our young men especially need to grow up thinking, whatever I do, I'm going out here and I'm going to fight. I'm going out there and I'm going to leave a crater somewhere in uh, the, the war works of the enemy. But, but, there, but that's not the norm right now. We, we've lived comfortably so long, we've lived in peace and prosperity so long, that it's, it's a bit of a, it's a huge adjustment, really, for us to think in terms of we've got to go out and, and get busy fighting, rebuilding, and beautifying our, our civilization, or we're going to lose it. We talked a little bit about it in the TBR Radio Presents the Dixie Heritage Show half hour about how our founding fathers and our Confederate heroes and, you know, those who are our heroes in history, not just in the South, but even in the greater United States, you look at, you know, men like Thomas Jefferson, or you look at men like John Adams, you look at men, you know, the 56 men who signed the Declaration of Independence, you look at John Adams or Samuel Adams, but, you know, you, you look at the Adamses, you look at these men, you look at men like Paul Revere, you know, pick your hero, if you will, from American history, as well as, you know, again, the Confederate leaders, men like Stonewall Jackson, men like Robert E. Lee. You look at these men and you even look at, at more modern heroes. You look at men like uh, George Patton or men like uh, Douglas MacArthur. And they all had one thing in common, and that was that they were all the recipients of a classical education. You know, these were men who, when the time came to take a stand, they took it instinctively because it was just the right thing to do. You know, you go to the Alamo even, William Barrett Travis, you know, Davy Crockett was on a hunting trip to Texas and he was walking back to Tennessee and he heard about the Alamo and, and most people would have just kept on walking, but he didn't. He stopped and he stayed and he gave his life in a fight that wasn't even his because it was the right thing to do. Because when there was a fight, these men just instinctively took their, their part in it. Whereas, you know, we live in a day today, like you said, we've, we've lived such cushy lives that, that we don't even have the instinct for uh, these fights anymore. But do you think that the reason that these men were, were willing to fight, whether it was on the philosophical level, whether it was on the political level, or when it came to it, even the uh, guns and knives level of actual combat, do you believe that one of the reasons why these men were willing to fight for their culture and their lives and their families and their their very civilization when it came under attack was, in other words, they were products of their education and we're products of ours? Yes, I do think that. The vast majority uh, of Americans have been brought up in government uh, educational institutions. They were taught enough history, you know, to, to make them docile, you know, uh, citizens that go out and do their jobs well without questioning, but, but not enough to really teach them what, what, it, what it's like to go out and really to win great victories or even to attempt that. We have lost the sense of the great heroes of the past as models, um, as icons to look to and to say, this is, this is what you should live like. This is how you should pattern your life. Robert E. Lee and his, uh, his famous sense of duty as, as being a satisfying way to live, even if it means great discomfort for yourself, even if it means sacrifice, that sense of duty is lost, and I'm just as susceptible to it as anyone. I, I, I like my creature comforts. I like the, the, the fact that we've been able to live at peace, mostly, but, we, but we've been too complacent and we've lost a lot. We, we need to get back to learning about those heroes, those great men, and realizing that these are not just stories. These are, these are men with flesh and blood and a whole lot to lose, and yet they, they were willing to lose it. So if we can, if we can recapture that, it, it, again, it's going to take some time, but the, the, the hope is that our children will be stronger than we are, and that our grandchildren will be stronger still, and uh, that, as uh, Douglas Wilson once said, that maybe 
the heroes of the next Christendom are close enough that we can name our grandchildren after them. Well, you've used that word several times now, Christendom. And of course, this is the Christendom curriculum. And as I read books from antiquity, Christendom was a very common term once upon a time in the West. But it's one that you don't hear anymore. That's right. Uh, or if it's used, it's used very loosely just to refer to the church or all Christians in the world or something like that. But historically, Christendom is a network of nations bound together by their common faith in Christ, focused at the national level, as the, as the name implies. It's, it's a word, that, it's a great word. It's, it's, it's a wonderful word that we need to recover. But the Bible doesn't teach Christianism as just a, a, a collection of um, propositions. It teaches, in fact, Christendom. I, I mean, I would even put it this way, without denying any, of course, of the, the fundamental doctrines, but, but what the, the Christian religion really is Christendom. It, it's about how Christ saves the world, he dies for the world, he rises again, he ascends to the throne of the world, the final Adam, the last Adam, taking up the mantle that the first Adam should have taken up, but did not because he fell into sin. Now, man is on the throne of the world, but it's not just man, it's the God-man. And he's reigning, on the, through, reigning over the world by converting and discipling the nations. He, he told the disciples, disciple the nations. He didn't just say go out and pass out tracts or make sure everybody gets to hear at least one gospel presentation. The disciples understood that. They would read the book of Deuteronomy. They knew what a discipled nation looked like. History bears that out. What did we see happen when we saw missionaries like Patrick and Boniface going out? They ended up converting uh, entire nations. They converted the peoples as peoples, as nations, and over the time, Christendom emerged very naturally. This is the thing we should have expected, given what Christ's great commission to us was, that nations would be converted, and it happened. Now, we're in a bit of a decline from that now, but we're also seeing a resurgence. There's a, there's a, there's a little book by uh, Steve Turley called The Return of Christendom, and it makes the point that these stirrings of nationalism that we see throughout Europe in America and beyond the West as well, are in fact the beginnings of a new Christendom. People are, are, are realizing that the lies of globalism are empty promises, and that they are in fact lies. And they're returning to culture, custom, tradition. Above all, they're returning to the faith of their fathers. We, we would wish that it's happening at a greater pace. We, we hope and pray that our peoples would, would repent, would return to Christ in a, in a wholehearted way. But we're seeing the stirring of that and I think that's why we, have, we can have great hope. Not, not that everything is going to be easy, not that the outcome of our particular battles is, is uh, certain. We have, a, we have a hard road at, to hoe. We have a, a difficult task ahead of us. Again, three generations, battle, building, and beauty, which is what John Adams indicated in a letter to his wife, Abigail. He, and I'm, this is a very loose quotation, but he said, I must study politics and warfare, warfare so that my son can study um, commerce and mathematics, and his son can study art and literature and painting and sculpture. That's that three-generation process, battle, building, and beauty. And there's overlap in all of them. All three will be present, I think, in every generation, but it starts with realizing that we've lost something very important. The thing we have lost is Christendom itself. Open your web browser and type in www.barnesreview.org and discover the Barnes Review magazine. In the Barnes Review, you will read vignettes of man, from the prehistoric to the very recent, from forgotten races and civilizations to first-person accounts of World War II and the late Cold War. There is no more interesting magazine published today, nor a more significant and important subject than real history. So visit www.barnesreview.org and subscribe to the Barnes Review. You can subscribe to receive the Barnes Review magazine in its print form, or in convenient electronic delivery. Our host has been a subscriber to both formats for years. So visit www.barnesreview.org and subscribe to the Barnes Review. Is it a complete curriculum? In other words, you know, obviously philosophy, history, theology, literature, you know, there are certain subjects that it's very easy to you know, read a book. But there are other things like mathematics, for example, or science. Just reading about them doesn't necessarily impart the skill. And so is this a complete curriculum? Does it cover all of the subjects or does it just cover 
you know, the philosophy and the theology and the literature, uh, you know, go into that a little bit. We do include those subjects. If any of your listeners may be familiar with the Robinson curriculum, we're very much like that. Um, it's a collection of books, and what we do to keep costs down is we, we use mostly older public domain works. For phonics, for example, we use the classic McGuffey readers. Mathematics, we use the Ray's Arithmetic series, which goes all the way up to, uh, it starts with you know, just basic counting and goes all the way up to uh, geometry. And we, that we use those textbooks that have sold tens of millions and, and educated uh, the generations of Americans at a time when we were, I think, better educated than we are now. And we integrate the study of uh, Bible, history, literature, music, art, and science into those. We, we include some also for math, for example, some online uh, links to online sources where you can do worksheets and check your, your work and things like that. But the heart of it was certainly Bible, history, literature, and but we developed the others around that and uh, to try to provide what could be a complete curriculum for those who need that. It could also supplement um, our, with our emphasis on Christendom and culture war for those who like their current curriculum, but would like to benefit from some of the things that we emphasize as well. You could make the argument, of course, that science and technology have advanced exponentially since the time of Thomas Jefferson. But you could also make the argument that Thomas Jefferson probably had a better understanding of science than uh, most of the kids running around on the playground today. You know, even without a complete science curriculum, is it possible that the books that are included in yours could, could give a greater understanding of the, the science of the world around them than even, you know, what's being passed off as science education in our schools today? The starting point for science in the, the secular schools is flawed. And so there's, there's, they're going to go off the rails uh, of necessity. We, we need to get back to a time when the men, and we have to remember that, that science was uh, really an invention of Christian men. Was it Rodney Stark of Baylor University says that uh, science arose only once in history, and it was in medieval Europe. It didn't. We had technology and some other things in other places, but the scientific method came about only that one place, and it did so because men were already expecting that because they they believed in a God who created a rational world that made sense that could be explored that ought to be explored. Pagan religions think of the world. Um, they, they kind of sacralize it, and they, 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 they treat it as untouchable. But the Christian view was, no, this world was given to us by God. We are to take dominion over it, and we need to explore it, find out its secrets, learn how we can make people's lives better through medicine, through technology, and so on. And um, we, we need to get back to remembering that and training up children as one uh, scientist, I can't remember if it was Kepler or who it was, said the, the idea is to think God's thoughts after him. And that, that's what we need to return to if we're going to recapture Christian worldview when it comes to science. Well, I think two of the greatest scientists in the history of the world were probably Newton and Einstein. And both of them spent more time studying their Bibles than they did studying science. That gives you the, the undergirding philosophy to go out and, and just make discoveries. Well, I know I'm going to, to really tick off a lot of our uh, Orthodox and Catholic listeners right now, but the church did not give us the Bible. God did. And the Bible had many penmen, but it had one author, and that author was God himself. All scripture, Paul told Timothy, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable that the man of God might be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And so God gave us all of the scripture, and so the same God that gave us the scripture created the universe. He knew the, the science of his creation, if you will. And, you know, for those who would say that the Bible contradicts science or that science contradicts the Bible, well, I guess what we know is science probably does contradict the Bible in some places, but maybe that's why the apostle warned Timothy to beware of science falsely so-called. In other words, when there's a contradiction between what we know is science and what we know is scripture, the scripture is always right. And of course, that brands us, to say that brands us as some kind of anti-science fanatics. But, but again, historically, science was a gift of God to men through the Christian church, and through, the, through Christian men who, uh, who already believed that God had created a world that ought to be explored. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's um, a slanderous thing for them to, uh, 
to say that, but that's one of their, their biggest tactics is to try to smear uh, anyone who disagrees with the, the science du jour as anti-science. And they, they, they profess with a loud voice their great love of science. But in point of fact, they, what they love is a, uh, is, is a, a scientific narrative that validates their worldview. We know that science always eventually catches up to the Bible. Just to give you a couple of illustrations of that, in the book of Job, it talks about the seven stars of Pleiades. And, and from uh, hundreds of years, even for millennia, it was, well, there are only six stars in the constellation of Pleiades. And some were even uh, retranslating uh, the Bible to correct that error, if you will, even though it was in all of the old manuscripts. But then they invented the Hubble telescope and somebody said, hey, you know what? There are seven stars in that constellation. And so science always eventually catches up to the Bible. I mean, science used to used to you know, be butchery. I mean, they used to bleed people to death with leeches. You know, then all of a sudden a doctor starts reading about a ritualistic cleansing and hand washing. And, you know, the, the spread of leprosy in, in the Old Testament, as Moses was talking about the spread of leprosy, and he said, you know what, I think I'm going to start washing my hands before I do surgery. And the mortality rate in his hospital went from 50% to next to nothing. So, you know, science always eventually catches up to the Bible. Tell us uh, about your history curriculum. What are, what are the sources of some of the books? You know, how have you approached the study of history? We look at it in the terms of uh, four ages of Christendom. So we're, we've studied the usual ancient world, medieval world, modern world, which is a typical three-part dis um, distinction that you see uh, in cur various curricula. We add the fourth year, Christendom Reborn, which is um, the future world. And uh, believe it or not, it's harder than you might imagine to study the history of the future. What we do there is we, we teach children to have the hope that Robert E. Lee talked about, to look to the future without seeing history, as they said, as just, you know, one damn thing after another, but actually having a purpose and that God is leading it somewhere. Fourth year, kids will study their own local history so that they can begin to think, you know, if I'm going to make a difference for the kingdom of Christ, if I'm going to see the future change for the better, it starts here at home. It starts with my people and my uh, family. But we, the, I think what we want to emphasize as much as anything uh, with history is that philosophy of history that says, number one, this is this is God's story, and He is not going to allow it uh, to descend into a darkness that uh, that ends in tragedy at, for the whole story. And again, that was the too too many I think of our our fellow believers have been brought up with that because that's been our cultural milieu here in America for a very long time. The idea that the world has to get worse and worse in order for uh, Christ to come back. And I believe the scriptures teach no such thing. And there are cultural consequences for that kind of view of history. Um, because when you, when you think, well, this is the last generation, Jesus is going to be coming back definitely in a few years. I think it might have been D.L. Moody who said, why polish the brass on a sinking ship? Um, why, why go out there and work to uh, reform institutions, reform our local churches, why try to defeat uh, the enemies of Christ, just go out and get involved with soul winning instead. Try to save as many people out of the, the coming conflagration as you can. But the Christian philosophy of history, I believe, is rooted in the Great Commission, go into all the world and disciple the nations. Uh, as Isaiah prophesied, because the, of the, the increase of his government and of his peace, there will be no end. Christians are accustomed to saying, of course, Christ's kingdom will, will never end. But Isaiah goes farther than that and says it will never stop growing. Of the increase of his kingdom, there will be no end. We, we ought to be expecting in history that, of course, there will be setbacks. Will, of course, there will be battles lost. But as we look at the grand scope, we ought to be seeing the gospel progressively winning in history. And I think we do see that. I think we, we're in many ways better off than our ancestors were 500 years ago in terms of our situation. We have it easier than they do. Of course, we're in a decline right now. And we've got to find our way out of that. But I think we need to expect God's purpose to work itself out in history and the nations and in the peoples and the way they embrace the gospel and bring it to bear on their own lives. So we, um, we want to see all of history through that lens of Christ's kingdom. We see Christendom in an incipient way in the ancient world, and of course coming to fruition in the first century, 
uh, with the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Christ. We see that coming to be manifest in the nations more in the Middle Ages. We see a, a, a setback in the modern world where the, the nations seem to have lost their way. But all of it is part of the, the grand story that God is bringing about, uh, which is ultimately a comedy, not in the sense of, uh, of jokes, but comedy in the sense of an ultimate happy ending. It's not a tragedy, it's a comedy. That's the philosophy of history we want to, um, we want to teach. And so we want, we, we, we want children to read not the watered down or, in fact, falsified <laughs> modern history textbooks. We want them to read original sources. We want them to get to know the men and women of history and have a conversation with them and hear what they have to say. This is, in a way, what Chesterton called the democracy of the dead, hearing the voices of those who have gone before us. And instead of just saying, oh, well, everybody in the media and in Hollywood and in Washington tells me that my ancestors were, were evil demons, let me listen to them and hear what they have to say. Let me hear their side of the story. But, but you, you're not even allowed to hear their side of the story these days. You're, the, the heroes you talked about earlier are demonized, and we're, we're, we're called on to hate them. So th there's an anti-history bias uh, in today's world where we, we have to think of the, 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 the past as you know, constantly benighted, constantly uh, just far, <laughs> far behind where we advanced modern people have uh, arrived at. And uh, so we, we want to correct for that as much as we can with the Christian curriculum and teach children uh, a Christian philosophy of history, and then to try to interact with, with the words of the great men. Uh, so they're going to read the, the life and letters of, of uh, Robert E. Lee, for example. They're going to read uh, autobiographies by some of the great men of the past, and uh, along with some books that we hope will, will help them to see, because history can be very complicated and very difficult to, to find what's most important to understand, especially when it's uh, accumulated under a lot of uh, misinformation for decades. So we, we do direct them to some good books by recent historians, but, but we want them to, to experience history as much as possible, but through the eyes of, of those who have gone before. Tell us just a few of the, the history texts that you're, that you're using. Are they actual history textbooks, or are these a more a series of autobiographies and um, you know things that were written by by the men who actually uh, were the characters of history. For example, you know Jefferson Davis wrote the rise and fall of the Confederate government. You know Winston Churchill wrote the history of the English speaking people. You know Hitler even wrote Mein Kampf. Um, you know, are you having them read those kinds of books, or are they reading actual history text, or is it a combination? It's a bit of a combination, but they are reading, for example, um, Lee's letters. They're reading um, R.L. Dabney's uh, biography of Jackson. There's some bio autobiographies like uh, Buffalo Bill and uh, Theodore Roosevelt. But they're reading some historians, too, um, a book or two by A.J.P. Taylor. Uh, we do assign some that are more recent that we don't, we, because of copyright, we don't include in the curriculum, but we... Uh, want them to, we encourage, you know, students to find them in their local library or local bookstores uh, or online. One of those would be Pat Buchanan's uh, book, Churchill, Hitler, and the Unnecessary War. We actually, uh, we actually assign Mein Kampf as well, because I think it's important to read both sides and to hear what, what, what did these men think? What, was, what were their aims and goals in these various conflicts? If you're like me, and I'll bet you are, you like to be on the cutting edge of honest news and accurate information. 26 times a year, the American Free Press newspaper can be delivered to your door, packed with the kind of uncensored news that I know you're going to appreciate. If you're ever dissatisfied with your subscription to the American Free Press, their guarantee is that you just drop them an email, and they will gladly refund the unused portion of your subscription. So what are you waiting for? Visit www.americanfreepress.net. Once again, www.americanfreepress.net. And find out about the American Free Press. Do it today. Extra, extra, free all the time. I know that in your advertisement, you use statements like defending America, defending the West. Why do you use those kind of statements? Well, because that, that gets to the culture war side of what we're doing. It is our conviction that the West is under assault 
by those who want to undermine it and uh, to tear it down from within, who really hate Western civilization because it's Christian, and they hate, they hate the fact that it's European, too, in some cases. We, we are obviously at the end of a, of a long cycle of history, and the world that we inhabit now is not the same world that my parents grew up in, even. It's really not the same world I grew up in. All, the, all of the, the assumptions, all of the, the cultural consensus that we once had, the, the common values and beliefs, all of that's gone. And it, it's gone for a lot of reasons. You know, I mentioned the, the uh, sort of escapology of despair earlier. Also, our, uh, we just we have um, given in to the assumptions of secularism and pluralism that told us that you know, the founding fathers didn't want religion in, in the public square at all. So all these things have resulted in uh, a great loss and, and a great uh, work of destruction of the great institutions that we have had and that we that were bequeathed to us. So there's a need to defend uh, America, again, understood as the people, not necessarily the government. The West itself, we've had people predicting the demise of the West for a while, and there are people that will openly say that Europe can, be no, can no longer be this monolithic um, thing that it once was, that European countries have got to become multicultural, it's got to happen. Um, America has got to have open borders, and this is a this is a human right for people to be replaced and to just be interchangeable. Um, and so we're losing uh, our we're losing our home. And if we can't correct this, uh, as Ann Coulter once said, uh, Americans will be homesick forever. I think that it's important for children because I said earlier, I think this is a two to three generation process. We've got to make sure that our children and grandchildren are able to carry this forward beyond our time. That starts with defending the good things that remain, but there's much that will have to be rebuilt as well. And, and then at that point, I think maybe we can start bringing forth uh, new Shakespeare's, and new uh, Box and Rembrandt's and Dante's to beautify the culture. So, but it starts again, as I said, with, with defending the good that remains. And so right now we have a lot of parents that because of the whole coronavirus pandemic are essentially homeschooling their kids. I know one of the reasons that I'm struggling right now is because I'm spending so much of my time right now basically homeschooling my son in spite of the fact that we're paying thousands of dollars for him to attend a private school. You know, a lot of parents who thought, well, you know, I could never homeschool my kid. I could never homeschool my kid. Now they're having to homeschool their kid. Yep. And so what is your advice to them? It, because there's the possibility that everything's going to go back to normal at some point during this, this summer and kids are going to go back to school next year. And, you know, maybe you have advice to a parent who didn't think they could homeschool their kid, but now they're having to do it. And maybe you can encourage them why they should not send their kid back to school in the fall. And then again, maybe there is another parent as they're homeschooling their kid right now, they're just automatically thinking, well, hey, maybe I should just homeschool my kid next year. You know, what do you think as far as not only the, the future prospects of homeschooling, but also, you know, maybe some advice to these parents who are now having to homeschool their kids to maybe encourage them to keep doing it even beyond the pandemic? Yeah, I think this is a tremendous time of opportunity for the homeschooling movement. People are getting to see up close what they'd only heard about before and probably heard about um, incorrectly to, to some extent. But I think for those who are thinking, oh, I can't do this, or is this really the best thing? I mean, they can start by just asking, how many times has your kid been bullied since they brought him home? How many school shootings have, been, uh, have they had to deal with? That's the kind of thing that you don't have to worry about in a homeschool environment. Um, as far as those who are thinking, man, I, I can't do this. I don't know how to proceed. One of the um, assumptions of our philosophy at the Christian Curriculum is that this does not require experts. In fact, experts tend to foul things up. Douglas Gresham, who was uh, C.S. Lewis's stepson, said, you know, we, we take what God has given us, which is a, a child has, a, a one, has two parents, one of each sex. He has uh, two sets of grandparents. He has aunts and uncles, a family, and we give them that. And instead... We take the, we rip the, the child out of that context in a very early age, 
put them in a room full of kids that are just as emotionally immature and worried and scared as he is with one adult stranger uh, leading it. This is, this is not <laughs> a natural setup, and it really can be damaging. So, and I'm not saying that everybody that goes to school is, is uh, wrong or messed up. To me, the bigger thing is let's make sure we get our kids out of the government schools, and then you know, we'll, we can have a debate later about whether homeschool or day school is better. But really, this can be done. Parents can do this. You can use, the, you can, as I said earlier, you can outsource your education in the sense of giving your children the great books that they can learn from. Let them have a conversation with the great men and women of history, great writers, authors, um, poets, historians, the great movers and shakers of, of our people. But you can do it. You can see John Taylor Gatto was New York City and New York State Teacher of the Year multiple times, one of the most lauded public school teachers of his generation. Early 1990s, I think he, he walked away from it and said, I, I can't do this anymore. This is what I'm doing is not teaching. It, it's, uh, it's really propagandizing and it's, it's destroying kids' lives. He became a big advocate of homeschooling. He said, listen, it takes about 100 hours to teach children how to read, write, and cipher. 100 hours, not 100 weeks or days, 100 hours, if that happens in an environment where those things make sense, where, where parents love reading and writing and love books, you can do this. A curriculum provides you a little structure, provides you with, with a plan, you know, so that you don't have to make it all up. Several of the families uh, that have joined us have said to me, they said, you know, I, I've been out there trying to do this on my own. I've been trying to put together a curriculum that doesn't teach my uh, young white boys to hate themselves because of who they are, that doesn't teach a bunch of lies about our ancestors, that doesn't um, teach them a false view of history and of, of the Bible. I've been trying to just piecemeal this together on my own, and now I find that someone has, has done this for me to help make it a bit easier. That's what I think a curriculum at its best does. And we've added to that the fact that we had this, this guidance to the worldview essays, the battle papers, and the study helps uh, to make it a little easier for parents. So there is going to be a return uh, or an attempt to return to the, to the status quo, Andy. And I, but I think that that would be a mistake. I think people who see this, who, who see uh, this has been their experience. I mean, who would have ever thought we would get to a point where homeschooling was mandatory in, in the United States? But we're there. People are seeing it up close. They're seeing, I, I hope, and I think that in many cases they're seeing my child is much better adjusted and happier here than he was at school. And many people just, just hated going to school. It, just, it, it was a terrible thing for them. Others liked it. You know, it's, it's partly a personality thing. But many children are, are just not safe and are, and are being, they're being actually propagandized away from the values and beliefs of their parents in these institutions. Homeschooling provides an answer to that. Homeschooling provides liberty, uh, scope for your children. It provides a way for them to maximize their potential. Um, homeschooling is, I believe, a superior way to do it. That we, this is borne out by the fact that study after study, test after test, homeschool kids are far better adjusted, uh, score far better on standardized tests than their public school peers. There, there's plenty of data to suggest that. What, We've, we've done that right. Homeschool is not how to do, do that part right. We just need to get a little better on the worldview stuff, and, and I think we will. Um, but for, for those who are thinking this is a horrible thing, no, just enjoy your kids. Enjoy having them home. Don't feel that you have to reproduce everything uh, from the classroom. Homeschool really isn't school at home. It is education. It is work and, and uh, academic labor and, and discipline and all the rest. But at the end of the day, it's all about getting kids to love good books. Give them book after book. Let them read. Talk to them about the books. Let them write essays each week on what they've read. Um, let them learn math and science and the other things. It, it's not complicated. It's not easy. I'm not saying that it's um, uh, without uh, any effort on our part as parents. But the Christian curriculum is one of a number of uh, curricula out there that have an element of self-education where children are taught how to learn. Uh, they're kind of, in a sense, thrown back on their own resources. Instead of providing every answer to every question they might conceivably have through lesson plans or through video lectures or whatever, we encourage them to read and find, and, uh, find things out and work through the problems on their own. Um, parents do provide guidance, uh, but as the child gets older, fifth grade and above, uh, there's a lot more independence with the children, and parents evaluate their progress through 
uh, their written essays, essays each week. Um, but I would, yeah, I would want to encourage parents. This is a tremendous opportunity. And for homeschoolers, there's probably people out there that are worried and uh, just, just are, are think this is a terrible thing. Show them the benefits. Show them what's, what's good about it and, and teach them to expect this to be a good thing. Hello, I'm Tom Strain, Lieutenant Commander-in-Chief of the Sons of Confederate Veterans. The Confederate flag, Confederate symbols, and the reputation of our Confederate ancestors has come under attack. The Sons of Confederate Veterans is actively fending off our detractors, but there is only so much that we can do. We need your help. Contact your local, state, and national elected politicians and tell them that you will not tolerate these attacks on our heritage. You can also visit scb.org Download an application to join us in our fight to preserve our Southern heritage. Visit scb.org today. If you don't have a Confederate ancestor and you are tired of American history disappearing, you can assist us by becoming a friend of the SCB. Please visit scbheritagedefense.org and make a donation to the Heritage Defense Fund. We hope that you will join us in the fight to defend the Confederate soldier's good name. I know that there are a lot of parents who are struggling right now because like you said they're trying to duplicate the classroom experience in the home and one of the things that they're struggling with is they are trying to teach in other words the teachers are handing them the curriculum and saying okay you know teach this to your kid and they're struggling with it so kind of explain where a curriculum like the christendom curriculum would be something that they would have more control over the lesson plan than what their teachers are giving them right now and how that would actually make the homeschooling experience for them as the teacher actually a lot easier as opposed to maybe some of the frustration that they're experiencing right now. With the curriculum like what they're getting from the schools, they, they're very limited and locked in to what's going on there. We provide a lot of re reading material, a lot of books, hundreds and hundreds of books in the Christian curriculum. There's there's scope for for choice there. Um, you don't have to go by a, exactly what they assign you every day, uh, as you would with those uh, other um, options. Here, you can choose the books that are either of most interest to your child or that address uh, a deficiency in their knowledge or a special interest that they have that they want to learn more about. You can you can tailor. And this is true of homeschooling in general, not just us, but homeschooling gives you the ability to to respond to your child and help them and and you can adjust what you're doing uh, to fit their needs if they're if, if what they're doing is really just too far advanced for them you can back off of that you can you can choose something a little easier or if they're just totally bored because they're, they're way ahead of the stuff they're reading you can give them something a little more advanced you can you can you have that ability to quickly redeploy as a homeschool parent and to make sure that your child is getting what they want. You cannot do that in a classroom setting where it's, it's one size fits all. And it's like an assembly line. You're going down the conveyor belt, you get the first grade parts put on, and you get the second grade parts put on the third and so on. Um, there's less ability. I won't say there's no ability to adjust there, but there's less ability than there would be in a homeschool setting where you can say, Here, look at my child. He, he's really good in science, but he struggles with writing, or he's, he, he's, ter he's terrible at math, he needs to work on that. But boy, does he love uh, poetry. Does he love the, the great novels uh, of, uh, of Western uh, history and the great literature that we have? And you can respond to that and see what, um, what their strengths are. We also provide reading courses in things like creative writing, um, calling vocation, uh, local politics and, and, uh, and various things that, that give kids a, a bit of a scope to find what they're interested in. Because every person that goes out and fights the battle in the culture war is going to do so in a unique way um, with their own strength. They'll, they'll, be able to do, do, they'll be able to make the best difference for Christendom if they learn what they're good at. Homeschool gives you a way to do that. And I think it's the most, for that reason among others, it's the most hopeful way to educate children. Because if there's just one of 20 or 30 or 50 in a classroom, uh, how much individual attention can they get from the teacher? Not much. But a parent can, can come alongside them and ask questions and draw them out and find out what's going on. 
I think that's one of the great things of, of one of the great benefits of home education, and we've tried to play to that and, and uh, incorporate that in our program as well. Well, one of the experiences that I have been having, and my son goes to a Christian school, and a lot of the curriculum that they use comes from Bob Jones University Press. I know a lot of Christian schools also use the Abeka curriculum, and a lot of homeschoolers are basically using the Abeka and the Bob Jones University Press curriculums as well. But one thing that I'm discovering, and I'm as, so, as soon as I say this, probably the headmaster or some of the teachers from my son's school are listening to the radio show, and I'm going to get a nasty phone call or a nasty email, but I'm going to say it anyways because it's the truth. What I'm finding is that this Christian curriculum is no different from what the public school curriculum was 15, 20 years ago. They've just sprinkled a few Bible verses into it here and there. But overall, I'm not really seeing a Christian worldview here. I'm, I'm seeing the Christian school trying to be the public school, and I'm also seeing a lot of times as a result, homeschoolers using these curriculums. You know, they're basically just, again, as we talked about before, taking that, that public school experience and philosophy and worldview and just putting it into the home education setting. I know you don't want to be critical necessarily of other curriculums, but at the same time, explain maybe some of the shortcomings of these other curriculums, even the Christian curriculums, why the Christendom curriculum sort of corrects those shortcomings. Because after all, if the other curriculums were perfect, you know, why would you have written a new one to begin with? First thing to, to set down is the fact that uh, any parent who's chosen to give their children a Christian education in a, in a Christian school or in a home school has already done a tremendously heroic and countercultural thing by refusing to participate in the propaganda of the uh, main the mainstream system, and so they're to be commended for that. And so Bob Jones, a Becca, and I grew up in a school that had Becca, a Becca books, and uh, and Bob Jones and various things like that. So I'm familiar with that. Um, they're fellow travelers with us. They're they're on the side of the angels ultimately. But I think you're, you're right that we can't just take the, the, the assumptions of a secular curriculum and try to add a, a, a veneer of, of Christian thinking on top of that. And I'm, I'm not necessarily saying, because I'm not intimately familiar with all the various uh, curricula out there, but I think that we, we have to come to grips with the fact that there really is no neutrality in education or anywhere else. Um, we, we can't just say, oh, well, math is math. It doesn't matter. No, it's not. Science, history, all of these things are taught from a specific perspective. We have to think through how are we teaching this. And I think this is why a textbook approach to education tends to be a problem. Because, and, and I know this is true of some, I won't name Bob Jones or, or Beck or anyone specific because I can't say for sure, but I know that, in, that over the years this has often been true with the Christian curriculum company is that they, they sort of outsource the writing to whoever, you know, any various writers uh, that work with the mainstream um, uh, educational establishment. And then they take it and they, again, as you said, they put some, some, a little Bible with it and, and sort of baptize it in that way. I think we, we, we can't go at it that way. And that's why reading the books of history that were written by those who were there, first of all, what, um, what in the Charlotte Mason world of homeschooling is called living books. Uh, you read original sources as often as you can. You read the diaries, uh, the letters, the writings of, of those who lived through these great events. And, and if you do that, you don't need a textbook to come along beside you and say, Here's what that means. And then, because as likely as not, they're going to be interpreting that in light, in light of the assumptions of the establishment. And that's not, that's not helpful at all. So uh, an, a, a back-to-basics curriculum that gets kids reading real books, living books, um, is to be preferred. Because if, if a child reads 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 books or more in, um, that, that are free, of the bias of today's textbooks, that's going to have a huge impact on them. And we, we include resources to help children, uh, and especially as they get older and read, begin reading more complex texts, uh, to know what to look for. 
um, to how to read a book, not uh, just expecting it to be a collection of facts, but to see it as having its place in the, the great drama of history, um, or in even books of literature, to see them as outgrowths of the men of their times. And, and, and so we, that's why it's important, I think, to read. If you're studying the Middle Ages in history, read medieval literature at the same time. That helps a lot. Um, so, again, that, that's, where, that's one weakness I would see in, in some curricula out there. And what we talked about earlier is also true. that I, I think that <clears throat> even the better ones uh, were written decades ago at a time when maybe the culture war stuff didn't seem as important as it does now. And they were maybe in some ways sufficient for their times, but we've reached a point where it, it, we're long past the point of having to um, take these issues up and say, we've got to do something. We, and, and, and this is a peculiar temptation, I think, in the homeschool, homeschool movement, because we love history so much. Um, but there's a danger of just sort of losing yourself in the past and not thinking, well, who are the enemies today that I need to be going out there and fighting? You know, we can get lost doing uh, you know, battle reenactments and, and the things that, I mean, there's nothing wrong with those things. But if, if that's our main focus and we're never thinking about how, what kind of tactics and strategies do we need to employ in our day, because our enemies today aren't um, red coats. They're not. Uh, they're not even the blue-coated Yankees. That we we have enemies in the gate using different uh, tactics, and, and the assumptions are all different than what our fathers faced. So we we need to read history. It's extremely important, but we need to take that those lessons of history and say, what am I supposed to do now? How can I go out there and make a difference? So um, I think most curricula just aren't thinking about those kind of questions. Um, and again, it's, it's, it's mostly not out of malice. I think it's just so many people have their lives and they, they're busy and they have jobs and kids and they, it, it's difficult for them to get involved in these things until it comes home to them for some way, some reason, uh, and they get you know, attacked by an internet mob because of some thing that they said five years ago that doesn't fit the narrative today. All of a sudden, they've got to think about these things, and they don't know how to handle it. They're attacked by a social justice warrior, and they lose their job and their livelihood, and nobody wants to hire them because they've been branded as a racist or something. So if children can be taught to learn these things early on and to, to expect conflict and to have some idea of what to do about it, I think they'll, they'll do better. That's what I was trying to address, uh, partly with the Christian curriculum, um, was uh, what I see as uh, an absence of deep thought on the, the specific cultural war issues of our time. There's plenty of curriculum that will talk about creation versus evolution, which is very important. We might talk about abortion or some of the issues there. They might teach some libertarian principles on taxes or economics, and that's good too. Very few of them are talking about critical race theory, cultural Marxism, social justice, and what those things mean and how they are being used today. They, they're not talking about the whole anti-racism issue. Um, and the way these things have been weaponized to destroy our civilization. So that, I'm hoping to address that, and at least in an introductory way, teach children how to um, teach children that these things exist, you know, and to be prepared when they go out there for what's, what's going to meet them. Well, you've talked about how your curriculum is going to provide the parent with thousands of books. And of course, to some degree, we know that education can be a racket. When I say it's a racket, like you go to your typical school and if your child loses a textbook or if they write in a textbook or whatever, they say, oh, that's 300 and whatever dollars because that's supposedly the cost of the textbook. And of course, right. we all know that it really didn't cost uh, McGraw-Hill 300 and whatever dollars to print that book, but that's what they charge for it and that's what our taxes are paying for it and we wonder why you know it costs millions of dollars to maintain public schools blah 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 but you're saying that you're going to give these parents thousands of books in case their mind is is in that school book mentality there where they're thinking thousands of books a hundred some dollars a piece two hundred something dollars a piece your curriculum you're offering an entire year's worth of curriculum for less than the public schools pay for just one textbook it's not just a year's worth well it is if you're thinking of it in terms of the annual membership yeah so it's 99.99 for one year of access to uh really 14 years worth of curricula right there because you get access to the whole thing pre-k all the way up to 12th grade 
uh, for a year. And the, the, the way we do that is by offering um, books in digital form, you know, digital delivery. It's an online uh, of course, you'll get access to our membership site, which also includes a, a Facebook-like community that's just for um, members of the curriculum. But it's it's all digital, so they're not um, getting the paper books that you're right are, are incredibly overpriced. It's it's the vast majority of the, the material comes through in, in PDF form. What we've done is save parents a lot of time by creating reading lists for each year that are appropriate for the age that that are that are. Uh, that provide the training in phonics and math and geography and literature and grammar and everything else. And then, of course, the great works of history, of literature that they're going to read as they go through the program. And we provided, wherever possible, we've, we've run down the PDF copies of these so that those are included. Uh, a small minority of cases, we don't have them. Or, or, or like I said, it's more recent books that are still in copyright, so we assign them, but they're not included in the curriculum. That's how we're able to, to save money. You know, again, John Taylor Goddard, who I mentioned earlier, said, you know, the one way to one, one of the ways to recognize true education is that it doesn't cost very much. If you're being told, and we have been sold the bill of goods that true education has to have qualified experts with a degree and a license, and it has to have classroom instruction, it has to have lectures, it has to have all these bells and whistles and lesson plans and quizzes and tests and hours of homework every night and all these things. That's, that system is sold to us as an absolute necessity. How can you educate someone without this? But in fact, the vast majority of that is a very recent invention. It doesn't have to cost a lot. It doesn't have to be complicated. Um, it's basically reading, talking, and writing. You read a book, talk about it together, um, you explore answers together. We provide resources like the Encyclopedia Britannica, an older version that was uh, an excellent, considered one of the greatest encyclopedias of all time. Um, Webster's 1828 Dictionary, other resources where you can find the answers you need together. And kids are assigned essays each week in Bible, history, and literature. So they're to write a, a, a short essay each week. So they'll get that experience. Hundreds of essays they'll be writing by the time they've graduated. They'll be reading hundreds of books. Some of their public school counterparts may have never read a single book from start to finish by the time they graduate. And they're certainly not writing dozens or hundreds of essays. So it's simple. It's, it's, it's not maybe easy. There is, there is labor involved for both the student and to some extent for the parent. But it's not complicated. It doesn't take experts. Read a book. Then read another one. Then read another one after that. Write about them. Talk about them. Learn your math. Take, and, and reading encompasses... That's why the three R's are so important, reading, writing, and resistance. That really encompasses everything. Because under reading, you've got Bible, history, literature, you've got science, you've got other things, geography and the younger grade. You've got all these things that you can get by reading books and by looking for the answers to the things you don't understand and writing about it. So, yeah, it, it doesn't have to be hard or expensive. And so we, one of the things we wanted to do most of all was to keep the price as low as possible. Um, so that that wouldn't be a major barrier to get their kids out of the public school, to get them at home, and to start them learning the great books of our civilization, start learning the Bible. So we wanted to do that, and what that's, we, we're committed to keeping that price as low as possible. That's how we do it. And we are now officially out of time for TBR Radio Presents the TBR History Hour, but I do hope that you will learn more about the Christendom curriculum, if you will go to www.dixieheritage.net, www.dixieheritage.net, and click the Homeschool button. You'll find a video there and some information about the Christendom curriculum, as well as a link. You can push the button, and it'll take you straight to the Christendom curriculum's website, and you could sign up there to uh, start using this great curriculum to help educate your children. I know that our family has begun using the curriculum ourselves right now. We're using it to supplement other things. But we're honestly, prayerfully considering using this as our primary curriculum starting in the fall with the next school year. Another thing that would be great to supplement your homeschool curriculum with is the Barnes Review Magazine, TBR. Go to barnesreview.org. Subscribe to the Barnes Review if you are not already a subscriber. And uh, when you do subscribe, we will give you access to the PDF issues of all of the back issues of TBR going back for 25 years. 
it's a great resource and there's a lot of great material there. Uh, you could probably use TBR Magazine almost as your sole history curriculum. Not quite, but almost. A lot of great stuff there. Anyways, we've got to go. But until next week, from all of us here at uh, TBR Radio, God bless. See you soon. By the way, Easter's this Sunday. He is risen. <laughs>